I'm a big Skyrim guy. But after beating the game over and over and over again, I started to crave some different Elder Scrolls content. I just got off the amazing train of Enderal, which is a fantastic Skyrim overhaul mod that's available on Steam and completely free. I truly can't recommend it enough if you haven't tried it. Bring me a nice crisp piece of However, as far as officially licensed Elder Scrolls content goes, there's a few things I haven't really tried. Morrowind and essentially everything before that, and The Elder Scrolls Online. Now, I have played ESO in the past, right when it came out on the PlayStation 4. I've always owned the game on PC, but I could never stick with ESO for long, as you can tell by this channel's upload history. Before starting this series, I had a grand total of 35 hours on Steam. However, with the release of Necrom and more tie-ins to Skyrim, I fell right into ZeniMax's trap and scooped up the new DLC. Maybe it's buyer's remorse, maybe it's me owning too many games games on Steam that I know I'm never going to play, but I decided to give ESO a real shot this time and to play the game completely different. I'm going to lock myself into each of ESO's zones one at a time, only allowed to leave after it's been 100% complete. And I'm not talking about the basic 100%, I'm talking about the full zone guide 100%, all fish, all books, all achievements, all side quests, everything must be completed before I can move on. Everything. EVERYTHING! There are gonna be a few exceptions to this rule, but we'll get there later in the video. Most of these zones in the Elder Scrolls Online that I'll be starting out in are over 10 years old, but so is Skyrim. I'm gonna see how well the stories and designs hold up after a decade on the shelf and try to provide an objective opinion because I've never played most of them before. I'm gonna be playing ESO like the developers intended. No spamming through dialogue, no skipping to the best mob farming locations. We're gonna treat each zone like its own standalone experience. It took me 33.15 hours to 100% complete the zone. Keep in mind, I'm not quite familiar with the game yet, I'm learning a brand new class that I've never played before, so expect me to be a little bit slower at completing stuff at the start. Ordon has quite the checklist of activities to do, so I'm going to group everything into three separate categories. Story activities. These are activities that are basically impossible to miss, like the main story, way shrines, striking locales, and armor stations. Every zone has these activities, and you're going to naturally complete about 90% of them just by doing the main story. In the middle ground, I have exploration activities. This would include things you have to go a little off the beaten path for, but overall they don't pose any inherent challenge. This would include things like delves, mundus stones, dolmens, lore books, or sky shards. Final category is the grind activities, and this is where I spent 80% of my time. These activities either posed a significant challenge to me as a single player, or took a considerate time or gold investment. I think we all know what's probably going in here, things like world bosses, public dungeons, points of interest, and fishing. So let's run through each of these items in the grind category and see how long it took me to do each. To start off, I'm gonna do something a little controversial. I'm actually gonna move the world bosses for Oridon into the exploration activities tier. <laughs> I was disappointed with how easy they were. I remember world bosses back in the day had to be tackled with a small group of people. I obviously haven't played the game much recently, but I was expecting more. Maybe it gets harder in later zones, I don't know, but this was way too easy. This is the first time I felt kind of grossed out by ESO's scaled leveling system. Uh, I should not be able to solo world bosses at level 20 with scraps on my back like the Deprived from Dark Souls. It should be possible for a max level character with all of their abilities and max level gear. I, I don't argue with that. But for a new player, the world bosses should not be easier than a random dragon encounter in Skyrim. I found I did struggle more with world bosses that were divided up to more than one target. Those ones were harder, but I was still able to solo all of them. And to put that in perspective, my character never died or was close to death fighting world bosses in this zone. I used no buff food or drinks, and I didn't even break a sweat. Okay, so now that we've demoted the world bosses, let's get back into the grind category and talk about fishing. And, and fishing broke me. I had to leave Oridon twice, and both of those times were because of fishing. Listen, I'm lucky enough that I won a giveaway on Skinny Cheeks' stream once for a bunch of gold. If I didn't have that, I think fishing would actually be impossible to do in Oridon. 
I wouldn't condemn my worst enemy to run around an ESO zone looking for fish bait. Worms, for example, are mainly collected through killing undead mobs, and I don't think Oridon has any, at least that I've come across. There's infected civilians that are hanging around in some areas, but they don't drop worms. I was going insane. I was laughing like the Joker in my chair, trying to find worms. And this led me to my first rule exemption, guild traders. I'm allowing myself to travel across Tamriel to buy worms and other fish bait on an alternate character. That's it, just fish bait. No gear, no weapons, I just need access to guild traders for bait. There are guild traders on Oridon, but fish bait is kind of an odd item for guilds to sell, so I have to use Tamriel Trade Center to find traders that are selling them. If you want to show your appreciation to the series, I would love some fish bait. I'll throw my player ID on screen right now and make sure to leave it in the description below along with my server. I had to blow like 30 grand on worms alone. Oh, you're paying way too much for worms, man. Who's your worm guy? Probably close to 70,000 gold on bait alone for this one zone, and it still took me nine hours to catch all the fish, which led to my next major rule exemption. I have a companion, specifically one that makes fishing easier. I don't think I'll ever switch companions, to be frank, because this guy's a Giga Chad who likes fishing, he says funny stuff, and his name abbreviates to Sans. I play Skyrim with companions, I think I should be allowed to play ESO with them too. The problem with ESO's companion system is that it was introduced like a year ago, so they don't naturally occur in the world until some of the newest DLC. So I picked one up, I went out of my way, I left the zone, but I'll never need to violate that rule again. Okay, with the fishy business out of the way, let's talk about the next mountain I had to climb, the public dungeon. And unlike the world bosses, the public dungeon bosses absolutely thrashed me around. In Oridon specifically, this zone has two achievements tied to the public dungeon. One of them is by killing the main boss of the public dungeon in the largest central chamber. The other one you get from killing every single boss in the entire dungeon. So this wasn't something I could just race through with another player. I had to actually get a group willing to follow me around and do every objective I needed. This took days. I met some really nice people who are happy to help, but the issue is Oridon is an old zone. Really old. There's not a lot of people running around this zone, more specifically, there's not a lot of competent, high-leveled characters. It's mostly people like me who are starting a new character and running through the zone. Essentially, Oridon is almost completely void of endgame players. The saving grace was a lead. I have no idea what it was, but on one day, there was a group of people farming the public dungeon for a specific lead. So I just followed them around for almost an hour, and eventually, with their help, I was able to get every objective I needed for both achievements. The final point in the grind category I'd like to talk about are the points of interest. There are 18 of these major side quests. I call them major because they're not a simple fetch and return quest. They tend to have their own story with a major choice you get to pick that helps shape the ending of a quest line, which is great. I love player agency in RPGs. They add a lot of replayability to the game. And to be fair, they weren't difficult to do at all. In fact, they were quite enjoyable. It just took a long time. At least 10 hours were spent doing these points of interest quest lines. I did try to weave them into my journey throughout Oridon, so I don't have a specific number on how long it took, but each of these quest lines is about 20 to 40 minutes when you're paying attention and you're not trying to rush it. Oridon was one of the first playable zones in ESO during its beta in 2013. It was originally designed for levels 1 to 15 players starting out with the Aldemary Dominion. I'm gonna try and do a 5 minute recap of the Oridon main story. If you're familiar with it and you just want to skip forward to the rest of my suffering, please feel free. However, since the zone is 10 years old, I'm willing to bet you don't remember it and you could probably use a refresher. When you land in Oridon, you quickly discover someone's trying to kill the queen. Being the morally upstanding citizen you are, you investigate around town and find some mercenaries doing suspicious things. You bring this to the attention of Captain Astania, who brushes you off and says she's cornered a criminal who she suspects has plans to murder the queen. This kind of lines up with what you've discovered yourself, so you go and talk to the guy. After talking to the so-called criminal, he says Captain Astania, the one who brushed you off earlier after reporting a crime, is actually the ones with plans to murder the queen, and she's a member of a group called the Veiled Heretants. The Veiled Heretants are essentially the antagonistic group of this entire zone. You're gonna hear their name a lot. 
I don't think I'm allowed to say the word, but they're akin to a certain German political party who disagree with the racial inter- Anyway, the Veiled Heretans want to kill the queen. So you return to one of the hopefully uncorrupt guards to inform them and the queen herself overhears. She asks if you'd be willing to investigate Captain Estania and surprise, surprise, she's evil. The queen then decides to go to her ancestor's graveyard to try and seek their blessing. A superstitious ritual that makes no sense, but apparently is essential for the entire population of the Aldemary Dominion to accept her as the rightful heir of the throne. But for some reason, all of her ancestors want to kill everyone who enters. You catch up with the queen, and one of her ancestors denounces her claim to the throne and says the Veiled Queen is the true heir. Wow, I wonder if this is related to the Veiled Heritants. Anyway, you go into the crypt with her and you find the root of the problem. One of the queen's primary advisors betrayed her and is essentially brainwashing all the ghosts to be hostile. Once you kill that guy, they become peaceful and give the queen their blessing. You essentially then go on a string of quests, ridding the Heritance corruption from multiple cities around Oridon. Matheson, Skywatch, Dawnbreak. It saves me a lot of time in this summary to basically say you do the same thing in each place. Skywatch is a little more important because you find out who the Veiled Queen is, and it's actually a woman named Estme, who is a lady of Skywatch and married to the Queen's brother. But basically 60% of the Ordon story is running from town to town, killing off the Veiled Heritance. You do learn a few things while running between these cities. One, the Veiled Heretants are racist. Racist idiots. They are backed by the Ebonheart Pact, which is one of the three major factions of the Elder Scrolls Online. And three, they made some kind of deal with Maroon's Dagon to be able to wield some of the power of Oblivion. So after clearing out three to four cities by doing the same thing, Esme finally flees to First Hold, where she opens up three portals to Oblivion. You have to find a way to close them, and then confront Esme in a final battle. After defeating Esme and closing down the portals, the Queen thanks you for essentially saving Ordon from being overrun by Daedra. She says she's gotten notice of some turmoil brewing in Eldenroot, the capital of Grotwood, and requests you travel there next. The main story took me roughly five hours to complete. Now again, I took my time and spoke to NPCs I probably didn't need to. I also did corresponding side quests in the areas of the main story, so I'm not quite sure how accurate that number is. Next time, I'm gonna do the main story all the way on its own so I do get a more accurate figure. But what do we think of the story? Now, as someone who's coming from Skyrim with zero prior knowledge on what comes after this zone, I'd give it like a solid C+, narratively speaking. The entire zone can be summarized in one sentence. The Veiled Heritance wants to kill the rightful Queen of Oridon and supplant her with a new leader. Your job is to stop them. That's it. There are no twists, there are no turns. You learn about the plot at the start of the zone, and by the end, you have foiled it. The only small twist is that the leader of the Veiled Heritants is the wife of the Queen's brother, ruler of the largest city in the province, and friend of the Queen. That doesn't really mean much to us though as the player. Frankly, we don't know either the Queen nor Esme that well. And the entire time we've been playing this story, the Queen has been betrayed at every corner by people she thought she trusted. I think if Esme was introduced earlier and we became familiar with her as a good person or a faithful friend of the queen, the betrayal would have meant something. You literally go city to city clearing out the veiled heritance because the higher ups are corrupt. Estme is the higher up of her city and following the pattern you could assume she's probably corrupt too. You know, this, this led me to be much more excited trying out the major side quests that were tied to landmarks. About half of them are still about the Veiled Heritance, but there's a couple gems that had a pretty original story. Shattered Grove had a really interesting story about a distraught father who lost his son in the war, trying to raise an army with the local wildlife. Fair had a secret vampire stashed away in the mines that would eat people. The college quest line was still about the Veiled Heritance, but I, I thought it was interesting as an allusion to the residential schools North Americans established for the indigenous population. It fit well with the theme the Veiled Heritants have of being racist idiots and essentially trying to civilize those they thought below them. So there are absolutely some great hidden gems across Ordon that you should get out there and explore. However, I would estimate about 70% of all content in this zone. This includes main story, major side quests, minor side quests, delve quests, the public dungeon quest, even world bosses are related to the Veiled Heritance. 
Now, this isn't inherently a bad thing. I'm sure lots of zones in the Elder Scrolls Online do this by revolving around one specific antagonistic group, but I've personally felt the storytelling behind the Veiled Heritance to be way too shallow. Their whole personality is that they don't like minorities. This means all the side content that's propped up against the Veiled Heritance as narrative support begin to feel shallow because they're not interesting or deep enough for you to want to learn more about them. They're basically just a plot device. Now, of course, there are exceptions like the college quest line or even the public dungeon because they use the Veiled Heritance as a substitute for a backstory rather than explaining that there's this new evil organization plotting to enslave all lesser beings. They're able to simply refer to the Veiled Heritance and move on and tell a unique story, simply using them for narrative convenience. It's the side quests like Silver Salem that just become another city to liberate from the Veiled Heritance. And that's another gripe I have with the campaign, is that you have to do the default liberation mission like three or four times and it's way too repetitive for my taste. However, given the fact that there are some side quests I really enjoyed in this zone that were unique and different and more related to Elder Scrolls lore overall, rather than just being about a group of bad guys that no one remembers, I would bump up my ranking from a C plus to a B overall for all story content in Oridon. Voice acting was phenomenal. They used one guy like nine times. He's the voice of the final boss in the uh, Banished Cells dungeon. I, I hope he got a great paycheck because he, he was everywhere. Overall, it's a starter zone, so I'm not gonna judge it too harshly, but I felt the antagonists of this zone specifically really held it back from being more interesting. Quick tangent here before we get into the verdict, it took me over 50 hours to make this video. So if you're enjoying it so far, I'd greatly appreciate any feedback you have to offer. I have over 100 gigabytes of footage, a 4,500 word script, and probably another 10 hours of editing to do. So if you'd like to see more of this content, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Or, you know, you can send me fish bait. Thank you for your consideration. Back to the video. I'm gonna give Oridon a star ranking out of five. This is my first video, so I don't want to set the bar too high, but I also recognize that this is a starting zone, and its goal isn't to push players to their limits right off the bat. The five-star ranking comprises of three smaller categories. The zone itself, you know, its environment and design, the main story of the zone, and finally, the side content of the zone. I'm going to give Oridon four out of five stars in respect to its environment and zone design. I really can't overstate how great this zone looks. It has personality, which I feel like a lot of zones in ESO don't. Too many places in this game are just green hills, mountains and trees, or desert yellow sand. Oh, hell no, man. The Oridon has a way more interesting color palette with pinks, yellows, blues, and reds. You're always surrounded by color, and maybe my reshade had something to do with it, I will admit, and if you are interested, I can leave a link to what I use in the description. But I loved exploring Oridon. It was a completely different atmospheric experience compared to anything I've seen in Skyrim or Oblivion. I spent a lot of time fishing, and trust me, there were definitely some downsides to fishing, but it was super beautiful. Like, all the time, every fishing spot was cinematic and really encouraged me to find new spots around the map just so I could get a different feel each time. If this wasn't my first review, I probably would have given its environment a 5 star rating, but I'm sure there's probably zones in ESO that look better, seeing as Oridon is over 10 years old now. I'm going to leave a gap for those 5 out of 5 zones, and I'm going to stick with my 4 out of 5 ranking for the zone design of Oridon. We've already touched on the story at length, but overall, I'd probably give it a 2 out of 5. Let's pretend I'm a new player coming to ESO from Skyrim, which is exactly my case, by the way. This zone story does not give me a strong enough impression for me to want to pay attention to the stories following the zone. I've heard ESO has some of, if not the best storytelling and quests in the MMO genre, but Oridon's main story is dramatically mediocre. The plot is given to you immediately and never changes. 60% of the main story is simply liberating towns from the same enemies, and we don't know or care about the characters. Another unfortunate point is that the main story has zero player agency. I can't shape the story or make any choices that have any consequence whatsoever. And you can't say, oh, player agency is a single player thing for single player RPGs. I just finished playing SWOTOR, by the way, the video is on this channel. Every single dialogue option in that game can change the story. Lord of the Rings Online, EVE Online, all of these MMOs have a great deal of player agency. 
And for the icing on the cake, it's even weirder because a lot of the major side quests have player agency in ESO, but the main quest is one path every player must follow, which drastically lowers replayability in my opinion. Why would I want to go back and do a zone story that I know can't change? There's no different endings, there's no different choices, I may as well spam through the dialogue. That's a vast summarization of what we already spoke about in the story segment of the video. I'm not going to rehash the entire segment. If you want to go back and watch it for a more detailed critique, you can. The side content, delves, public dungeons, world bosses, points of interest earn a 3 out of 5 star rating in my point of view. The world bosses were overall disappointing, as I've already touched on. I was expecting a difficult challenge with really great loot and was disappointed on both of those fronts. The side content, in terms of point of interest missions, in my opinion, did a really good job in comparison to the main quest line of Oridon. Half of these major quest lines are still pretty bland and they're just another location to liberate from the Veiled Heritance, but the other half have some of the best storytelling in this zone without a shadow of a doubt. The Banished Cells is also the dungeon for Oridon and the only one I allowed my character to queue up for. I actually don't think it's required for the 100%, but I did it anyways multiple times for the XP and gear. Just wanted to throw that in there. Overall, Oridon gets a 3 out of 5 star rating from me. As a starting zone for the Elderberry Dominion, it does a fantastic job capturing players with its innate beauty and zone design. There are multiple major cities to visit, all which feel unique and have a different role to play in the main story. However, the main story is lacking for a starting zone. Not doing a good enough job, in my opinion, on hooking new players to become invested into the Aldemary Dominion storyline. Ordon's side content and unique stories unrelated to the main campaign did a fantastic job at re-engaging my interest into the zone and encouraging me to push through. Overall, as a Skyrim player trying out the zone for the first time, it was okay. It has me excited about moving forward into Grotwood, hopefully getting away from the Veiled Heritance and into a slightly more engaging storyline. But if the side content keeps pace in terms of great storytelling with impactful decisions and interesting rewards, I'm always going to be on board. So with that being said, this was a Skyrim player's perspective on being locked in Oridon until 100%. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed, and I hope to see you in Grotwood.